Well, using that information, scientists have been able to form a timeline of Earth's early history. If we look at some of the first solid bits of matter, those very first sort of planetesimals, so if we go out in outer space and collect that matter, which was done in a recent mission, or if we just look at outer space material that's fallen to Earth, what we find is that it's about 4.5647 billion years old. Now that seems really precise, but it is really precise. Using that sort of information and knowing something about how long it takes planets to form, the really those sort of embryonic planets took about 4.5646 billion years to form. And if we look at Earth itself, and some of this is using mathematical models and using our understanding of what must have happened in the formation of Earth, Earth reached its present, its 64% of its present size, about two-thirds of its present size, about 4.5547 billion years ago. And in our textbook, we use the age of 4.56 as sort of a rough number for the age of the Earth, even though we know that it only reached 64% of its size here, but more or less, give or take a few millions of years, the age of the Earth is 4.56 billion years, and that's a pretty solid number. That means anything that's happened in Earth's history had to happen within a span of 4.56 billion years. We know from moon rocks, remember we went out and collected moon rocks during the space missions, during the Apollo missions, if we date those moon rocks, and this gives us some confidence in these numbers, if we date the moon rocks, we find that they're somewhere between 4.54 and 4.44 billion years old after Earth formed. So sometime between the first sort of coming together, the planetesimals, and Earth being about sort of teenager size, the moon formed. And then if we look at for signs of water, and we can look at zircons, which are minerals that we find in rocks, and you find them in the mall too, similar kind of mineral, not the same zircons. If we take the dates of those and the ages of those, what we find is that liquid water existed on our planet about 4.3 billion years ago. So we take 4.3 billion years as the age of our world ocean. Isn't that great? Well, Earth has lots of water, but where did it come from? And in fact, I'm going to spill this end of the story right now. We really don't know. It's not clear where all this water on Earth came from. No known source currently can explain all the water that we find on Earth. So we're going to take a look at some of the suspects, and I'll tell you why some of those suspects are favorable or not so favorable. Proposed sources include cosmic gases, so water vapor in outer space. If you remember in that first sort of ignition of the sun, we kicked up some dust and kicked up some gases. And in fact, if we look out in outer space, we can see water vapor, so we know it existed. Comets, comets are a, a very uh, sort of hot topic for where water came from, or at least were once um, thought to be maybe the answer, and that's sort of not uh, played out so well. And meteorites, just water containing meteorites could be a possible source. Well, let's examine these. <clears throat> if we look out into outer space, we see that there's lots of water. There's oceans, many, many, many oceans of waters in the, in the constellation Orion and in many other places. And this was a discovery that was made by the European Space Agency in 1996. We find lots of water in outer space. The problem is, when our sun ignited, it sort of blew up and heated up an area around the sun well within where Earth exists today. So any water that might have existed between the Earth and the sun, and any water that was nearby Earth, at least any water in the form of cosmic gases, would have been blasted away when the sun formed. So cosmic gases, as far as we know at this point, don't really explain what, where our water come from. It just doesn't seem likely that if the sun blew up and ignited in the way that we commonly think that stars do and in the way that we observe stars in outer space, it doesn't seem likely. So cosmic gases have pretty much been eliminated as a possible source of water. Comets, 
And this is an exciting one. We know comets are icy. We know Bruce Willis blew up a comet to prevent it from hitting the Earth or something like that. This a couple of years ago, a mission went out and slammed into a comet with a sort of refrigerator-sized spacecraft. And this is what resulted, this very bright light. And when we looked at that, it turned out that, wow, comets aren't so wet as we thought. And so at least this one comet that we've looked at doesn't seem to have enough water. In fact, if we look a little bit more closely, we'll see that comets can be ruled out for other reasons as well. Well, this is a picture of a meteorite. This is up in Willamette, Oregon. It's on display at the, uh, it was found in Willamette, Oregon. Um, it's on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. This is a iron meteorite, too dry to provide any water. It's made out of iron. Uh, we don't find much iron in water. But there is a type of meteorite called a carbonaceous meteorite. It's sort of like a coal kind of meteorite. And it turns out they're kind of wet. Now, you don't normally think of rocks as being wet, but you don't normally think of a piece of bread as being wet. But if you heat it, it will let off steam. So it's kind of analogous to that. Scientists once thought that these carbonaceous or carbon-containing meteorites could be a source of water on Earth. But as it turns out, there's just not enough of them out in outer space. So unless they've, for some reason, gone away in the 4.5 billion year history of the solar system, it's not likely that they were the source of water. Okay, we're going to come back to isotopes. Remember deuterium? If we measure the amount of deuterium in different some of these different sources and also measure the amount of hydrogen in some of these different sources and we can measure the amount of deuterium and measure the amount of hydrogen because when light shines through an object or when objects give off light hydrogen and deuterium pull out certain wavelengths or certain colors and so we know about the concentration of hydrogen and deuterium in things like comets and carbonaceous meteorites those kinds of things if we look at the isotopic ratio, and that's the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen, that being the isotope of hydrogen and hydrogen itself, if we look at the ratio between those, what we find is that comets have a ratio, a deuter deuterium to hydrogen ratio, of about 300, way up here on the scale. If we look at Earth's water, it's about 150. How could comets with a D to H ratio of 300 be the source of water if Earth's water, Earth's ocean water, is, around, is half that amount, about 150. Carbonaceous meteorites, as I just talked about, have a range of D to H or deuterium to hydrogen ratios somewhere between, oh, about 125 and above 200. So Earth's water falls within the range of the carbonaceous meteorites, but given that there aren't enough of them in outer space, they just don't seem to add up in terms of the source of water. So as it turns out, this question of where did Earth's water come from? Well, the answer is we really just don't know. Not yet. But science keeps moving on. And scientists keep looking at this question. And who knows, someday we may discover some source of water that we didn't even think of or didn't even know about. And that's the great thing about science. Discoveries are always yet to be made. Well, you can always check out some of the activities in 2.1 if you like. There's some additional resources in the end of chapter book. And there's a great NOVA series on the origins of Earth and the origins of planet. And it touches a little bit on where water came from, those kinds of things. And I suggest you check that out if you're still interested in this subject. Well, I thank you for listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me.